All right. Well, today uh, you are in for a treat. Uh, Pastor Sean has been uh, setting up every weekend while he's been away on sabbatical. He is, by the way, if you've just dropped in here for the first time in weeks, Pastor Sean and Becca are on sabbatical uh, and having a wonderful time of recharging and refreshing. And uh, Pastor Sean has recruited some people today uh, for a Take 5 message. And it's, it's, it's likely that you have been here for one of these in the past, but if you haven't, it's a really cool thing. Because what happens is, he basically reaches out to five different people. He doesn't tell them, he doesn't ask them what to say, he doesn't give them a theme or anything like that. He just says, search, you know, seek out what God wants you to say, and share that with everybody. And what this does, it, it's, it's really important uh, what a Take 5 message accomplishes, in addition to just simply you being able to hear uh, what God has put on somebody's heart. It shows you how the body of Christ works and can work, right? Uh, we know that Pastor Sean gets up here week after week. He shares the Word of God. It's legitimate it's, and it's powerful, but we get to see how the body of Christ works and the Spirit moves through all of us. And so let's go ahead and have our Take 5 uh, speakers come on up. Give them a hand as they come. So today we have uh, my wife, Sarah. It's kind, of an, it's kind of a family thing today, a little bit, at least getting started here. My wife, Sarah, uh, my mom, Jenny, uh, my friend, Tom, <laughs> and my friend, Lydia, and, uh, well, my nephew, Sean. I mean, I guess I didn't even, yeah. So, but I've already heard what they have to say, and it's very good, and, and just like always, you're going to hear, even though they're sharing different things, you're going to hear this theme woven through it. It's so cool. So let me go ahead and hand it off. Good morning, Journey. Um, so before I start, I was thinking about one of my favorite scriptures, which I think we all have many. Uh, Hebrews 10, it talks about spurring each other on, encouraging each other, and that's what we're doing. That's what Pastor Sean does. When you listen to preachers online or Pastor Aaron or whoever's up here, we're encouraging you. We're spurring each other on in this life, and that is a good thing. Um, so I believe I do have a scripture to put up. Yes. <laughs> so James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Um, so that is an action. That isn't something you just sit and do and expect for God to speak and to do things in your life. You actually have to draw to the Lord and he will draw near to you. And so something about me, I am a creative person. We each have our unique special things, right? And it's important to recognize that in yourself and in each other so that we can work together. That's important. So creating, that's something I do. I love whatever it is, whether it's my home or a gift or something I create, whatever it is. So God said, Sarah, create the space. You create spaces. Tell people how you create the spaces to how, and where you meet with me. So I have a list. My list is very long. I probably don't have time. I think I went over last night, and I'm sorry. <laughs> it's really hard to condense the things God is like speaking to you. Um, but I do want to be um, respectful of this time. So I'm going to just throw out a bunch of places that God and I have met but I've been intentional about drawing to God in those places. Number one, my red truck. I have a little red Dodge truck and I love my red Dodge truck. And I drive this little red truck through the country, through the city, and I will spend time talking with God or who's ever in my seat next to me. We will talk about the Lord um, and we talk about deep things. We laugh, we cry. Um, but I have spent times getting out of my little red truck and crying to the Lord. But I have created a space. Think about things in your life that you love, that you have. Create the space. Second place, the church. <laughs> I come here alone sometimes. I have a key. Thank you, whoever gave me that. Um, I crank up the music, and I have church. I dance around this place. I go through all the rooms. 
I love how God speaks to me in this place too. Um, third, outside. God's outside. <laughs> um, I know that's duh, but um, I want to share a little story about an outside moment I had with my kids. I homeschool, and there was one morning a couple years ago, um, so we kind of, homeschool doesn't look normal for me. I don't know why God asked me to teach sometimes, um, but you just do what you can and you go with it. Um, there's days I haven't taught, and then there are days I teach well, and the days I don't teach well. <laughs> um, but there was one day I was like, hey, God, we did pretty good today. Um, so in the morning, we prayed, and uh, I knew that Becky DeWitt was teaching on the Holy Spirit here at the church to the kids. And so I thought, okay, God, I want to help the kids too. It's our job as parents or grandparents or whoever you are to help the littles kind of understand things. And so I said, okay, let me equip them more. So I taught, I said, let's go outside. Because teaching, you do not have to just be in a room. You can go anywhere to teach. We've gone to Dunkin' Donuts to teach. <laughs> you go places that you love. <laughs> I do love donuts um, and coffee. <laughs> um, so anyway, sorry, sidetrack donuts. Jesus, okay. Um, so anyway, we're out. So I go, let's go outside. I, I want to teach you about the Holy Spirit. And so we have this big tree with um, swings on it. My youngest daughter calls it our memory tree. And so we sat under there, Haley, David, and Kylie. And we saw, all sat under there, and I taught about the Holy Spirit. I opened the Bible, and I said, now let's listen. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit and what he's saying to you. And so we all sat, and we stopped, and we listened. And I said, David, what did you hear? He didn't hear anything <laughs> at the moment. And actually, Haley had something that God spoke to her, and so she shared. And I was like, oh, that's good. And I said, do you want to hear what God told me? <laughs> and I said, what I heard was, let's run. We live on about three acres, and we just it's kind of like a shotgun um, land. And so... I said, I just felt like we were supposed to run down, this, run down our hill and then just lay in the yard on our back. And so I said, let's go. <laughs> and so we ran as fast as we could, and then I, we just all fell, all four of us. And we fell on our backs, and we just looked up at the sky, big sunshine, and we just listened, and we laid there. And I said, David, are you hearing anything? And he said, yeah, I, I think I am, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say. I don't know. And I was like, it's okay. Just tell me what you think you're hearing. And he was like, I don't know. I, I don't know. And I was like, just say it. And he was like, I think I'm hearing God's proud of me. And I was like, that's so amazing. Yes, God is proud of you. Thank you for listening to that. And then Kylie heard something. And it's just, we created a space you know, and it wasn't in a four wall. It can be in four walls. It can be anywhere. But I was intentional. I was being thoughtful. God, what are you doing? How can we be a part? What are you saying? How can I hear better? Right? The cabin, our prayer cabin. So this big book, this isn't just my big notebook, by the way. <laughs> this is actually something I keep in our prayer cabin. Um, and in the front, it says, leave a prayer or encouraging note for the next friend staying at the prayer cabin. So this book is full of encouraging notes that God has spoken to people. Um, and before I share some of these things, I want to say a couple more places because Sean's going to hit on this in a little bit. Um, another space I create is time with friends, time with my husband. I create space where it's intentional and I invite the Holy Spirit into that conversation in that time, whether it's over coffee or running or walking or working on the house or projects. You create space and invite God in. And God will either say something or sometimes he's just as present. And that's good with a friend. That's important to create that space. So um, the cabin, the prayer cabin, we created a space. And it's very, very special. 
there's some freedom moments I've had in that prayer cabin. Um, and could I have gotten that anywhere else? I don't know. I mean, maybe. But I knew Aaron and I, we knew we needed to create a special place to honor the Lord. It's very special to walk in there. Every time I go in, I say, hello, Lord. <laughs> it's really special. Create a space. I mean, it doesn't have to be a cabin. Help us. We, I want to help you create that if it's a closet, if it's a room. I mean, sky's the limit when it comes to spending time with the Lord. But it's a very beautiful place if you can create that. So here are some things that God spoke to me and some other people coming through the cabin in just over the last two years. So what I wanted you to do, um, some of these might jump out to you and be like, I want to hold on to that too for me in this season. So this is kind of the assignment right now. Just listen, and if something stands out in this season of your life, or it might stand out in two years, I don't know, or 10 years, jot it down in a notebook. Or remember it if you have a good memory. I do not have a good That's why they are all written down. So if they jump out, write it down. Are you excited about what God's plan is for you? The pieces aren't all in place yet. You are a giant. Favor is coming. Look for the huckleberries. I say that a lot. Pastor Sean shared that. Look, keep looking for the huckleberries. Go after it. Step out. Be bold in what God is asking you to do. Go to the secret place. God's steadfast love is better than life. Fast your words. Read the scripture out loud. Declare it. Proclaim it. Right, Chris? <laughs> Bring the dark secrets out to the light. There's freedom. Don't quit. Don't quit on Jesus. Don't quit on yourself. It's about to turn around. I am making a new way for you. Practice the gifts of God. India. I heard that once recently. Write books and finish them. God's love is armor. Draw close, no closer, even closer to the Lord. Are you present right now, and are you listening? Here's my last one. Go deeper, God said. No, deeper. God said no, deeper. That's my word. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. And this is my mother-in-law, Jenny. Okay. I have just a couple very familiar scriptures. Um, the first one, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this will come into play at the end also, but right now I need this. This is not my spot. <laughs> uh, somebody years ago gave Richard this at the university, gave him this picture. It was an old time classroom. And in the middle of it, there was this little dog, with the spotted ear. And the title of it was Everybody Has Their Spot. Uh, folks, this is not my spot. <laughs> My spot is in a pink room at home, surrounded by paint and paintbrushes, and uh, that's where I'm comfortable. But through Christ, I can do all things, because he gives me strength. Um, when Sean first uh, presented this opportunity here for us here, um, this was back in January, and the, immediately, the thought came into my head was, introduce yourself. Uh, I said, well, I could probably do that. That's, that's not too deep, right? Um, and uh, I got to thinking about that. And I don't know if anybody else ever has this issue of tripping over your tongue when you're trying to introduce yourself to somebody new. 
more than likely, I will introduce my family, my son, Aaron, uh, my daughter, Becca, all of my marvelous grandkids, and three, I mean, I'll do a genealogy report and forget to give them my name. Um, that's not the way to introduce yourself. <laughs> First of all, you've got to know who you are. <laughs> and uh, that's been an issue with me for a very long time. Uh, I guess insecurity, um, identity crisis, who am I? What am I doing here? Uh, how can I help? Uh, what do I have to say that somebody needs to hear? Uh, I hope somebody else can relate to that. But uh, I've dealt with that my entire life. And just by the grace of God, my kids did not inherit it. Uh, they don't have a problem with who they are. But um, that's kind of where this came from. Introduce yourself. And uh, in the process, it made me look and see, OK, who am I? And the scripture that immediately dropped into mind was Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is not, it's no longer I who live, but Christ liveth in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. The faith which is in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself up for me. Um, that is uh, who I am. I've known Jesus since I was tiny, uh, well, five or six anyway. And I've known him as a little baby in the, uh, in the manger. I've known him as a good shepherd. Uh, I've known him as my savior. I've known him as my master, my lord, my teacher, my guide. And more recently, I've known him as my friend. All of these aspects of Jesus are in me. And uh, when we moved to Liberty, now I'm not saying anything negative about St. Joe. Uh, it's been there a long time. Uh, but when, when we moved here, it's like I actually found liberty. <laughs> Something lifted. And uh, at that point, I began to change in, in ways that I would kept telling Richard, I don't know who I am anymore. Uh, but... Uh, one day in our living room, the kids were there. I, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure Aaron and Sarah were there. I think Sarah I was there. And uh, I was just saying, we were new to Journey. And if you've noticed, Journey, it's very important to serve. And it's not because you're building the church. You're making it stronger. You're making it bigger. That's good. But... The main reason to serve is that you become united. You form a family. Uh, you form relationships, friendships, uh, almost sibling relationships. And um, I was just telling whoever was there that day that I don't know what I can do. Uh, I can't sing. Uh, I can't clap and chew gum. Uh, uh, I'm, not good, I'm not good at greeting people. I can't tell you how many people I greeted when we first started here and said, oh, are you new here? No, I've been here two years. Uh, and pretty soon I discovered, ah, maybe greeting is not my spot. <laughs> so uh, I would just say, what can I do? And I think it was Sarah said, well, why don't you have a women's Bible study? And I said, no. <laughs> Me, try to teach anybody 
anything? I don't have anything to say. And immediately, that Galatian scripture dropped into my mind. It's not Jenny, poor, who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. And all of those aspects of Jesus, the baby Jesus, the gentle uh, shepherd, the master, the Lord, the teacher, the leader, the guide, uh, the friend, they're all in me. And, uh, and Jesus isn't confused on who he is, uh, what he can do, or how he stands with his father. He knows. He always knew. That's in me. Uh, my confidence, self-confidence, grew because it was the confidence that Jesus has. And now I have it. So uh, I found freedom because Jesus. Uh, I can express myself because of Jesus. He allows me to express myself as I give his love and his compassion, his understanding to other people. And I gave my life to him a very long time ago. And that has made all the difference. I love how God weaves all this together, and you'll see this. It's just, it's just awesome. It just, it's awesome. But, so I have a question for you all today. What does a heart of a servant look like? It's a big question. But it's really pretty simple to define. In simple terms, having a heart of a servant is done to honor God, not man. It's to honor God. Serving's not done for praise or recognition or power or personal reward. It's not done for any of that. Serving is done in humility. It's done as a form of worship to God. Last week, and you all saw the video uh, just a little bit ago, but last week we had VBS, and it was awesome. There were over 50 volunteers that gave their time, gave their, their skills, their abilities, their efforts, they gave to make that happen. And why did they make that happen? One reason, Jesus, to provide an opportunity and an atmosphere for these kids to know and to experience the love of Jesus. It's really the bottom line of what that was. You all are amazing people. I look at all the, just the magnitude of all the things that you all do to serve Jesus. You know, whether it's greeters or ushers or hospitality team. I mean, it, it, all of these things have to happen to make this happen. You've got life group leaders. You have kids ministry that happens. Between I don't know if you all know this, between the kids, uh, kids' church and all of the early ch childhood you know, classrooms and all those things, there are over 100 volunteers that make all that happen week after week, month after month. It's incredible. And you just, it's, God is so faithful and so good to provide all of that to make that happen. Now, I'm going to also give a, a quick plug because July and August... There's a lot of vacations that happen, which are awesome. I mean, we all need to take vacations. But there's some opportunities to serve right now in July and August in, in, in the children's area. So if that's something that God has put on your heart, I'd encourage you to pursue that. And you don't have to, and I'm going to tell a story here in a minute, but you don't have to know what you're doing because you have the heart of God, and that's all you need to make that happen. There's also Elevate Youth. There's outreach ministry, harvesters. I don't know how many people have served in harvesters, but there'll be 30 to 40 people that will be on a Saturday. It's the third Saturday of every month that are serving the community and giving out food to the community. It's an awesome time. It's a blessing to be there. It's a blessing for the community as well. And then there's marriage ministry and Hillcrest Hope and, and Liberty Women's Clinic. And the list goes on and on, and there's some that I've forgotten, but there are definitely more. You all are absolutely amazing in the things that you do to make all that happen. 
So here's a quick story that you're, you're going to understand that you don't have to know what you're doing in order to serve God. So Brian and Kirsha Owens, they're not here this weekend. They're out of town, but their family's here. Uh, Brian one day was, was greeting, and I came out in the lobby, and he walked by, and he said, hey, um, we, we're out of coffee. And I'm like, <laughs> well, you're asking the wrong guy because I don't drink coffee. I don't like coffee. I don't even like the smell of coffee. And I've never made a coffee, you know, pot of coffee or a cup of coffee in my entire life. But I'm thinking, you know what? This can't be rocket science. And I know there's a list on the wall back in the coffee production area, a.k.a. the closet, broom closet. But, um, and so I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's go make coffee. It can't be that hard. So we walk back there, and it says put two cups of, of you know, coffee grounds, whatever that's called. And so I pulled the little thing out. I dumped two cups in it. I'm like, this is simple. It just says hit large for, you know, like, just make it happen. I'm like, okay. So I just hit it. And Brian and I continued to talk, and then he, um, he kind of looked funny all of a sudden, and he was like, um, is that, we supposed to put a coffee filter in that? I'm like, I don't know. Like, this is a $10,000 coffee machine. Like, I, I don't know. I think you should just, I think it should just make coffee itself. I don't know. Like, it should just know that we're out of coffee and just make coffee. And so I said, uh, give me a cup. So took a cup, stuck it underneath there, and yeah, I'm telling you, some people got some coffee that day, because it was like <laughs> motor oil and dirt coming out of that thing. And so my point in all that, well, one, I'm not allowed to make coffee anymore, um, <laughs> but actually I make coffee all the time. Uh, but my point in that is to serve, you don't even need to know what you're doing, because clearly I had no idea what I was doing when it came to making coffee. But um, so... If you, again, if God is giving you the heart to serve, you don't even know what you have to do. Like, you, you don't have to know how to do it because God will make that happen. Didn't make coffee happen that day, but... So, point number one, to serve is to give. Take a look at John chapter 13. Uh, it's, it's a big chapter. We're not going to go through all of it, but there's a couple things I want to pull out of that. And one is just before the Passover feast happened, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. Think about that for a minute. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew that he was, his time was done. He knew that he was going to be returning to the Father. And he served. He washed the feet of the disciples. There's no other verse in the Bible that gives a better description and a better example of being a heart of a servant. Point number two, to serve is to sacrifice. Mark 10, verse 45, where even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice as a servant. He showed us many examples of that in his life. He came to us. He came to set us free. He came so that we could be all that God has created us to be. So I want to go back to that original question. What does a heart of a servant look like? simple. looks like Jesus. It literally looks like Jesus. So my challenge and my prayer is that all of us ask the Holy Spirit, how can I be a servant? How can I have a heart of a servant? Show me how I can be more like Jesus. Show me how I can serve my family. I can serve my church. I can, I can serve all those that come into contact with me. Not for my purpose, not for my benefit, not for me, but for others. Show me how to be more like Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. First of all, I want to, I didn't say this last night, but I thought it whenever I started to talk and... Um, so basically all of us, we brought up, our papers show our age, is what I realized. Sean Michael ends up using his phone here, and we all have paper. Anyway, I just had to point that out. Just, it's a lot more comfortable having paper than an iPad, in my opinion. But, okay, 
I will get to my point. And I think they all tie together so well, too, just so that, okay, because here what I have to say is, where do you put your time? Oh, where do you put your strength? And where are your thoughts and your devotion? Where do you put your time? I want you to think about that as I share with you what God has shown me about strength. Psalms 124, 8 says, Our help comes from the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. The word strength means to be strong in bodily or muscular power, mental power, with force, firmness, and courage. And in the Bible, God mentioned strength or a derivative of the word over 360 times. So you can see how important God thinks it is. So I have three types of strength strength that I want to just talk about briefly. Physical strength, emotional strength, and spiritual strength. Physical strength obviously comes from working your body, right? Working your muscles. Emotional strength, I believe, comes from renewing and strengthening your mind. Spiritual strength comes through resting in the presence of God, worshiping, prayer, taking time to be in his presence. To obtain a physical strength, you're going to have to do some physical work. To obtain emotional strength, you're going to have to renew your mind and walk in the spirit. I believe you have to have to have emotional strength, you're going to have to have spiritual growth. Spiritual growth comes through pressing into his presence. And I want to focus just a minute on our physical strength because I think it goes hand in hand with emotional and spiritual. So whenever you go to work out, strengthen your body, whether it's weights, whether it's cardio, whether you're gonna run, swim, cycle, or just do weights, right? You're focusing on a particular part of your body. And if you only focus on that part, then only that part's gonna grow, right? What you focus on grows and that will strengthen. The same is true mentally, I mean, Yes, yeah, spiritually, with your heart, your mind, and your spirit, what you focus on gets stronger. I want you to imagine like a stream, a river, how it constantly flows, right? The water is moving. That's life, right? It's constantly moving. It doesn't stop. But then you can have, if you've seen a puddle, you've seen water that's just sitting, hasn't moved, so it becomes stagnant. It'll stink. I believe the same can be true of ourselves. If we're not moving physically, emotionally, spiritually, same thing can happen. So I want to highlight two things of how you can walk in the strength of the Lord. We must be free of fear and walk by faith. You must replace fear and doubt with God's promises. Doubt will hold you back from walking out God's purposes for your life in strength. Doubt keeps us from believing things will get better. It's too hard. That's what doubt says. Isaiah 43 one through two says this, but now says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob? Who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, he says, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by name and you are mine. Verse two says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will walk through the fire and you will not be burned and the flame will not consume you. One more, Isaiah 41, 10 says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, and he will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. And I just want to take a minute and highlight a few people in the Bible that God used who may have had fear or doubt, had a thing, and God said, nope, here's the strength. I give you the strength. I wanted to like go in detail with some of these guys, and I don't get to. I just get to highlight them because we only have some time. So if you don't know these stories, then you need to read them yourself because they're very encouraging. Moses, when he led God's people out of Egypt, right? Gideon, he led the Midianites and and he defeated the Midianites, excuse me. King David, there's a huge story there. He has more than one. And if you didn't hear my husband's sermon a couple weeks ago, he did an amazing job with the David and Goliath story. So you should listen to that. But God strengthened him on countless times. Joseph, Ruth, Esther, Joshua. So that's just to name a few, because the Bible is filled with people that may have had a doubt or a fear, and yet God gave them the strength to walk it out. And I want to focus on Joshua just for a minute, because he has two, in two of the chapters, and like not that far from one another, God commanded him seven times overall within two chapters, be strong and courageous. 
Obviously, he needed to hear it because he kept doubting. He kept being afraid. Deuteronomy 31 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear. Do not be in dread. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And then Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you, he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Seven times he was reminded within those chapters. And then 2 Timothy 1.7, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And some versions say self-control. How important it is to have self-control over your minds. Second, second point really quick is to be focused and seek him. Psalms 105.4 says, seek the Lord and his strength and seek his presence continually. Just like Sarah said, time, it's so important to get in his presence, no matter how long you have or not. And you need to replace the negative that might come in, the fear, the doubt, just a negative thought period about yourself with the positive. There are so many verses in the Bible to pull from, to memorize, so that when you hear a thing, it's like that five-second rule, you let it go. You dismiss it. When you know it's not positive, when you know it's not encouraging to yourself, you need to dismiss it. And I just want to leave you with this. To walk in the strength of the Lord in every situation, you've got to stay focused and allow him to be your strength. Strength comes by humbling yourself. Strength comes by admitting your faults. Strength comes from being in his presence. Strength comes from growing through tough times. Strength comes through pressing on. Strength comes through resistance. Strength comes through pressing into his presence trusting him and never giving up. And I just want to leave you with this. What is your default setting? Like Aaron said it last week. Where are your thoughts and your actions? Are you going to allow God to be your strength? And I just want to introduce you to my nephew, Sean Michael. Yes. So good. I'm just so honored to be a part of this group. Um, just... Jenny, what you're saying about, like, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Just ever since I heard that last night, it's just been, like, we've just been meditating on that just over and over again. It's so good. I hope you're taking notes because it can be, like, really jumbled with all these different speakers. With it just be like a fire hose of really, really good information. But um, I just want to encourage you to just take a note. If there's something that you hear from somebody and it makes an impact on you, you're going to want to write it down because you will forget it. You want to write it down, and then I would even say just go up to them after the service and just encourage them and just talk to them about that. Just let them know how much it made a difference to you. But um, just by a show of hands, how many of you guys would agree that the kingdom of God might look like a little different than our culture, right? Just by a show of hands. Okay, yeah, most of us would agree with that. And we see that in a lot of different ways, right? Like, like what Leo was saying, like the, the kingdom strength, the strength that comes from God, is going to look a little different than the strength that comes from man, right? It's going to have a different feel to it. It's going to have a different power. It's got a different source to it. And we've talked about, you know, how kingdom uh, marriages, like a marriage that is built on the kingdom of God, is probably going to look different than a marriage that isn't, right? It's going to have a different feel to it. And so what I want to talk about tonight is something that I haven't heard too much about. You know, when we, I want to talk about kingdom relationships, and normally when we talk about kingdom relationships, I feel like we take the angle of kingdom marriages, right? But I want to talk about what a kingdom friendship looks like and a kingdom friendship because kingdom friendships, just like everything else, are going to look different than friendships that we make in this world. And actually having friends, having godly friends that are based in like based on the Bible, that our kingdom friendships is not only just a good thing to do, but I would argue that it is even a command from God. You know, when Jesus was talking about the greatest commandments, he listed two things. He listed love God and love other people. It's hard to love somebody that you're not friends with, right? We're obviously supposed to do that, but kingdom friendships are so, so important. You know, I've heard Pastor Aaron say a lot that there are certain aspects of the character of God that are only accessed through your relationship with other people. And that is so true. That is so true. And kingdom friendships are so, so important to us. But I don't know if you guys know or would agree 
that um, it's a little bit more difficult to make friends as adults, right? Like, if for the adults in the room, I find it, it's a little bit more difficult than when I was, say, in, like, fourth grade. Um, in fourth grade, there were two things that were, like, the most important things in my life, and that was Super Mario Brothers and football. I don't know if you guys can remember when you were in fourth grade, but those were, like, the two most important things in my life. And so when I was in school and I went to recess, they didn't have a Nintendo laying around. So what do you guys think I did? Football, right? I was playing football. And in fourth grade, you, you know, especially for the boys, you don't necessarily go up and introduce yourself like, hi, my name's Sean. You know, I, I, this is the school I go to. Uh, you don't really do that. You just kind of pick up a football and just start throwing it at other kids, right? And then event, that's how you made friends. And so we were doing that. And... I was, you know, defending this other guy. I didn't even know his name at the time, but the football came our way, and so I went up to swat it. So I, like, threw my arm up to try to swat it. He threw his arm up to try to catch it, and so when I threw my arm up, I swung down as hard as I could with my arm to try to swat the football, but my arm locked around his shoulder, and so I ended up just throwing him on the ground very hard. Well, long story short, he ended up breaking his shoulder, um, and so... You know, the natural next step is for both of us to go to the principal's office. And so we're sitting there waiting for the principal. He's got some sort of, like, cast thing on his shoulder just to keep it in place. And it's fourth grade. And so we're both, you know, we're not upset at each other. We're both just laughing at the fish tank that's in the principal's office. Like, we're looking at the fish, and we're giving them names and stuff. I don't know. The point is, it's a little bit more difficult to make friends as adults. Like, in fourth grade, it was so much easier. Even in my teen years, it was easier. But as an adult, it takes a lot more intentionality. It's, it feels difficult. It feels more difficult to do. But again, just a show of hands, how many of you guys know just because it's difficult, just because it's hard, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right? If it's a command from God, that doesn't mean we should just stop doing it. And in fact, I want to argue that it is healthy to push through the difficulty. It is healthy. It builds character. It's just because... It's difficult as adults to make kingdom friendships doesn't mean we should stop trying. And that's not to discount or to, to disregard um, maybe past hurt or past trauma even or the baggage that we carry, the baggage that other people carry. You know, there, we don't have time to get into it all, but there's plenty of resources. There's books, podcasts, you know, YouTube videos to check out. Um, but I just want to say just because it's hard to do it, doesn't mean we should stop trying, especially if it's a command from God. So I want to list just two things that are so important of why we need kingdom friendships. And the first thing is this, is a friend helps in hard times. A kingdom friend will help in hard times. Proverbs 17 says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I, I take that scripture to say, another way to put it is like a brother is born for trouble or for your trouble. That's not to say that they're causing this trouble, but it's to say that it was almost like they were there to help you so much. It's almost like they were made for such a time as this. They were made to be there to pick you up for that. They were born for this moment to help you with that. You know, Ecclesiastes talks about how two are better than one, because when one falls, the other can pick the other up. But woe to the, person, woe to the one that it falls and has no one there to pick him up. You see, if you're serious about living this Christian kingdom life, if you're serious about living in the kingdom of God, then you need to have this in your tool belt. You need to have good, godly, close friends in your tool belt. If, because, you know, the Bible says we're going to go through hard times. We're going to go through hard times. As much as we would like to avoid that or maybe not think about that, at least that's my personality. I like to just not think about that stuff. But we're going to go through hard times. And I have been so blessed by some of my friends that are kingdom friends, that we, we do our best, and they've been, they're close to me, that when I do go through a hard time and something, you know, happens, whether it's like financial, emotional, <clears throat> and I do go through a hard time, I've experienced Ecclesiastes, and I've experienced that two are better than one. I've experienced that a friend loves at all times and a brother's born for my trouble. And so you're going to want this on your tool belt. The next thing is a friend is going to improve you. A friend is going to improve you in your walk with God. It talks about how iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. We're going to, it's not, a friend isn't just born for our hard times, but it's going to help improve us during the good times and the bad times. And so the truth is having a friend goes both ways. It's not a one-way street. 
we talked about how there's certain things that you can only do in the kingdom of God with other people. And so if you want a friend that loves at hard times, that helps pick you up, then we also are committed to be that friend that's born for someone else's trouble. You know, if there's someone you know that is going through that trouble, especially if it's a friend, it's almost like you were born for that moment. It's almost like you were born for that moment with your gifting and your personality. You know, if you have friends that are, you know, during good times, you were born for this moment to sharpen their iron. You were born for this moment to be there with them. And so here's my challenge as we wrap up here today is, are your friendships shallow? Do you feel like you're just going through the motions with your friends and it's just the same thing week in and week out? And, you know, not that those things are bad things and that some friends are going to be like that, you know, no matter what we do. Some people are going to be like that and those aren't bad relationships. But the challenge is, do you have good kingdom relationships that are close to you, that are in your inner circle? And so I just want to dare you to go deeper to dare you to have a kingdom friendship, to dare you to take that next step, to dare you to be the one that introduces the kingdom principles. You know, we talk about how, like I said, marriages, we talk about how they're built on the rock. And, you know, a three-stranded cord with a man, a woman, and Jesus cannot be easily broken. What if we took that principle with our friendships? What if we built our friendships on the rock? What if we built our friendships with that three-stranded cord? You know, this can look as simple as, as just calling up a friend and asking, how can I pray for you? This doesn't have to be complicated. It can look as simple as taking them out to coffee and just talking about their life and praying for them. You know, be born for someone's day of trouble. Be born to sharpen their iron. Be the one that will lift a brother or a sister up. Bring the kingdom culture into your friendships. You will see the fruit that comes out of that, and it's a two-way street. The Bible says that it's better to be the one that gives than to receive. Blessed is the one that gives rather than just receives. And so as we wrap up here, I just want to invite everyone to just stand up. Um, We're going to have the worship team come on up, and we're just going to close in prayer, and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit um, into into our time right now. So Holy Spirit, I just want to thank you so much for the words that you've given all of us here today. Right now, I just invite you in and just, I ask you to just organize my thoughts and all of these things that we've heard. And I just ask for one thing that stood out in all these messages. One thing that stood out that I can just directly apply to my life this week. Holy Spirit, we ask that you bring this holy conviction right now. Is there something I'm doing that isn't kingdom? God, we just thank you for your loving correction, your loving words towards us. And we're just so honored and humbled to be your kids. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you're with us and that you guide us and you're here for us. We just thank you that you are all those things. We just thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.